you're where you are because God wants you to hear a specific word for this specific time in your life. Or maybe he wants to prepare you for a time that is to come. Maybe he wants to help you to have a better perspective on a time that has already occurred. But this message is going to bring power to your life. Amen. Well, today we're not just going to be talking about one Bible character. We're actually going to be talking about a couple million. We're going to be talking about the children of Israel. And I don't know if you enjoy connecting the dots throughout the Word of God, but I feel like we do a disservice if we don't help you connect the dots. Because I'll be honest, I grew up in church, and a lot of times they were talking about people that I'd heard of, but I never could really put this whole story all together. And so I want to back up to the book of Genesis for just a minute and help you to understand who in the world are, are the children of Israel who end up in this desert land. And this truly is the land of Israel that you see behind me. Um, this is the desert land. Brad and I actually got to go to Israel in 2011. And when we drove through this part, literally, there's like a highway now that goes through it. And that's what it looks like today. <laughs> So as you're going through the desert part and through the wilderness part, this is exactly where the children of Israel would have been. So we're going to back up for a minute. If you look in your Bible in Genesis chapter 12, um, you see a story of a guy named Abram. You'll know him better as Abraham. God changed his name a little bit later on. But God came to Abraham and he told him, he said, I have a plan for your life. I have an incredible plan for your life. I want you to be the man the father of a huge nation who one day I will send my son through your bloodline. I want you to be a man who I'm going to give this land, this territory known as Canaan land or the promised land or today the land of Israel. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to your descendants. Well, the problem was Abraham didn't have any kids. Okay, so Abraham is like, yes, what an awesome promise. God tells him, pack up, move out to a land I'm going to tell you. He lives in the land of Canaan as a foreigner. And for 25 years, he doesn't have a son. 25 years later, at the age of 100, at 100, he has his son, Isaac. That's insane. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob, Jacob loved to wrestle. Not really. He wrestled with God all night long one night. God changed his name to Israel, and he had 12 kids. How many want that many? Yeah, those boys raised their hand last time. He still has. He wants a football team in the back. I don't want, I, we have 12 dogs. We don't need that many. And we have four kids. I don't want any more. That's enough. He had 12 sons. Joseph was one of these sons. If you were here in week one, you heard all about Joseph in the land of Israel, and the, or in the land of Egypt, pardon me. And when he was there, he was second in command. He saved the entire land from drought. However, all of these descendants, okay, so they're all the descendants of Abraham. They now live in the land of Egypt. That's where they're multiplying, and they have now been enslaved. Well, if you read in Exodus, the story of Moses is raised up as a prince of Egypt. He raises up, and God sends him into Pharaoh to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And if you remember the promise God gave Abraham, the promise was for this new land, this new land that they were going to go in and possess. So when they leave the land of Egypt, they go across the Red Sea parts, they walk across, and now they're headed out into the wilderness. I love this story, and, and, and where it picks up uh, from there is, is, is we see, we see the, the people of Israel traveling across this desert land and it, and it took them so long. It should have really only taken a very, very short amount of time, but it took them a really, really long time. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Normally it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, going by way of Mount Sire. And we look at from 400 years after Joseph, 400 years goes by, and, and God finally brings forth his promise to this people and he uses Moses to to release them from the bondage and the slavery of Egypt and slings them out into this wilderness into this desert and it takes them 40 years when it only should have taken about 11 days and if they would have walked if, if there wouldn't have been a couple million of them then they could have probably made it in three or four days but instead it took 40 years and you're going to find out why in just a minute and this is so going to just 
encourage you and challenge you in a great way. That's right. See, here's the deal. God took them on a plan. He took them through the wilderness because they needed to grow up. How many has ever been told you need to grow up? God does want us to grow up, and God had taken the children of Israel into the wilderness because they needed to grow up. If you look in Exodus, we're going to see what he tells them at this moment. He says in Exodus 13, When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. I want you to look at this map for just a second. You notice in the passage I just read you, it said that God did not lead them straight through because they would be going through the land of the Philistines if they were to have gone the shortest route. You could have gone from Egypt over here on the left side over to the land of Canaan. It would have been a straight shot if they would have went right through the Philistine territory. But God said in his word that they might just turn around and want to go the other way. Why would they want to do that? Because obviously they weren't mature enough for what was about to happen. They would have gone in and had to do battle. See, they had been enslaved for 400 years years and God knew that if they would have go up against the Philistines they would have not had the faith to believe that God could have delivered them and so God needed to take them on a journey through the wilderness down around and go through a lot of junk that would teach them a lot of lessons how many of you guys know that throughout our life we're going to face things and every time we do it's an opportunity to learn something it's an opportunity to grow every experience every place you ever go every opportunity God places in front of you is an opportunity for you to grow that's what God was doing with the children of Israel he took them on a season of growth they cycled and they cycled and they cycled in this wilderness for 40 years can you imagine now, I was just going through the desert like for a few days with my family, and I was in an air-conditioned vehicle, and I was complaining. Think about these millions of people. It stinks. It's hot. A lot of times they had no food. They had no water. I mean, they had it really, really bad. But was, what was so crazy about their situation is that they just kept going in circles because they wouldn't shut their mouths. They just kept complaining about how horrible things were. And God was just saying, okay, fine. You're going to complain. What you're doing is, is you're, you're challenging me as God. You're saying that you don't think I can do any better. And so since you don't think I can do any better, I'm just going to let you keep circling and circling and circling and circling. You know, there's a certain kind of worm. I don't know what the name of this worm is, but it's, it's so dumb that you put it on the top of a styrofoam cup and it will go in circles until it starves to death and dies. Think about that. It's exactly what the children of Israel did because the Bible says that they went on and on and on and, and that the Lord was angry with Israel and made them wander in that wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation that had sinned in the Lord's sight had died. So look at what complaining does for God. It's not going to get you brownie points, I can tell you that. You complain with God, and you might just end up in a desert longer than you want to be there, and he might just let you stay there until you die. Isn't that encouraging this morning? Know this, that God has a plan and a purpose for the desert, but it's not for you to complain. It's for you to be cultivated into something better than you are right now. Right. If you're taking notes this morning, I'd, you can write this down. There's three things that God does for us through the wilderness. The first thing is God wants you to know, even in the wilderness, that he's got a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29 and 11, I love this passage. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. This was the same promise. This actually, when it was written, was for the children of Israel, and it applies to us today. God had a plan for their life all along. He had told Abraham all the way back hundreds of years earlier, here's what I'm going to do for your descendants. God had never changed his mind. And for each one of us, from the moment we were conceived and we were being grown in our mother's womb, God has a plan for our life. The problem is we get in the way. We start looking at circumstances around us. Maybe we've even been invited to know God, but we've turned down that opportunity. We want to do our own thing. We've got our own plans. 
You know, the Bible says many are the plans of a man's heart. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. We can plan and plan and plan and plan and plan. But if we want to succeed in life, it takes us lining up with God's plan. It takes us lining up with God's plan for our life. And what begins to happen in our life is God begins to say, hey, once we begin to realize he's got a plan, he says, I want to grow you. And the way I'm going to grow you is I'm going to send you through trials. Point number two is this. God's going to take you through a season of growth. If you have your word, you can open it to James chapter 1. Love this passage. The word of God is so rich. Guys, if you're not taking time to read God's word every day, you are missing out on one of the most incredible experiences of your life. I promise. I say I love it because, honestly, I love the entire word of God. James 1 says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That's insane. I never understood that till I was older. God says, consider it joy when trouble comes. When trouble comes my way, I'm usually not celebrating. But yet God says, hey, look, it's an opportunity for joy. Why? Because it's an opportunity for you to see that God is in control. Not you, but God. He goes on in this verse and he says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. God's ultimate purpose for my life and for your life is that each one of us would grow to be more like Jesus until the day that he returns and takes us out of this world, that every day we would grow. So he will allow you and he allows me to go through some very tough times. And those tough times, those things we call in this life trials or tests, They are so that we can grow. And I don't know if you realize this, but every time you're given an opportunity to grow, you can either do one of two things, okay? On a test, you either pass or you fail. Some of you guys know what that's like. You either pass or you fail. Did you see that? (laughs) She looked at me. Some of you know. Okay, what most people like. don't know that I like graduated high school with a you D. You graduated high school. I graduated, right? and that's the miracle. Number one, number two is with like a D minus average. Okay, it was I bad, it. but I passed. I passed. That's awesome. <laughs> God is setting each one of us up for that. He's like, here's the deal, guys. You can either pass or you can fail. The children of Israel they kept failing. Over and over and over. See, here was the deal. He would go out there in the wilderness. He had these opportunities for them. There was no food. Okay, they're in the wilderness. There's no food. There's no water. And rather than them realizing, hey, God just parted the Red Sea for us, and we walked across on dry ground, I guess God can do whatever he wants. They started complaining. And they started like almost 2 million people running their mouth. And they were complaining to one another, God just brought us out here just so we can die in the wilderness. And Moses began to get super frustrated because who wants to lead a bunch of wine bags? Not me. Don't whine in this church, okay? We don't want to lead a bunch of wine bags. Moses didn't want to. And so he goes to God and he's like, can you just give him water? Can you just give him some food? And so God rains down manna from heaven. For 40 years, they ate the same food over and over and over and over again until they were so sick of it. Over and over, God provided for them over and over and over. And then the day came when he said, there's the promised land. You can see it. There's only this one little section of wilderness area that they were actually circling. And there you go. You see the dotted lines right there in the corner. They were within just, I'm talking miles of Canaan. And that's where they lived for over 20 years, right there, circling. Right there is just where they circled, over and over and over. And they can probably even see it. They actually sent spies into the land. And when the spies came back, they came back and 10 of them said, that is an awesome land. It's unbelievable. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the best land I've ever seen in my life. But here's the deal. There are giants in that land and we are not gonna take over that land. We're not gonna possess it. Let's go back to Egypt. But there were two guys, Joshua and Caleb, who had enough faith to believe that God had said that was their land and they could go in and they could possess it. But nobody else believed. And so as Brad read earlier, that entire generation died 
except for Joshua and Caleb. They never got to go in and possess it. How sad is it that God has something for our life, but we would never, ever pass the test and grow up enough to go in and possess it. See, had they gone into battle with the mindset and mentality they had, they would have all died because they didn't have enough faith to believe that what God said he was going to do, he was really going to do. So if God said it in our life, we've got to believe it and we've got to grow up and realize that he's got an incredible plan, but he wants to grow us. And make no mistake that God preserved and spared the lives of Joseph, I'm sorry, um, Caleb and, and, and Joshua, because they had the heart and the mind to believe that God could do it. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. He preserved them and he allowed them out of their entire generation. They were able to enter into that promised land because they are just like, they are, they are the perfect example of what God wants us to be. He wants us to be the kind of people that we look into the future and no matter how challenging it looks, we believe that God can, can help us, that God can be with us no matter what we're going through. And they had the vision to, to look at, at the future not as it was, not, not just with their human eyes, but they saw it as, as though God was able to get a hold of it and change it and rearrange it for his glory. They knew that as long as God was with them, that they could do anything. They were unstoppable. And God wants us to have the same attitude and the same mindset about the wilderness and the valley and the, our future that we're moving forward into. He wants to see it not as we do with our human eyes, but see it as it can be with God beside us. It hurts and, and it causes us pain when we grow. How many of you guys know that, that growth can be uncomfortable and growth can hurt? I, I remember when I was a, a, a small boy and I was sitting down uh, in the floor my parents' bedroom, and we were watching the um, we were watching the weather that night, and my leg started to hurt so bad, like this pain that was unreal, came over my leg, and I said, "Dad, I said my leg hurts so bad, my whole leg is just in so much pain." And he said, "Son, it's it's you're growing." I said, "What?" I said, "He said, yeah, those are." No, that's just what parents tell you when they don't know what's wrong. With they you. don't know what's wrong. <laughs> he lied to me. They just say, "Oh, it's just growing pains." Go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, I probably uh, had something serious wrong with me. We never figured it out. But no, so, so I, I learned something that night, and I thought, that's crazy. I can actually feel my bones growing, and it, and it hurt really, really bad. And you know the phrase, you know, growing pains. It, 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 you really do feel a tremendous amount of pain when you grow. And it wasn't long ago that, that Mia said the same thing to me. I was tucking her in at night, as I always do every night. We pray with our kids. We love on them. We tuck him in, and she said, Daddy, my leg hurts. And I said, babe, I, hey, I, I know what the answer is. You're growing. She's like, what? <laughs> you're growing. Your leg hurts because your, your legs are getting longer. And if you know Mia, her legs don't need to get any longer because she's got some long old legs. But, but growth hurts. It causes pain. But you know what the beauty of it is? Is that when it's all said and done, you get bigger and bigger and bigger. My dad used to, uh, sounds kind of, kind of, I don't know, like serial killer kind of, but my dad, we had this pantry with all of our canned goods and everything, and, and, and the sheetrock wall inside of it, my dad would take this big, long knife, right, and he'd say, all right, stand up against the wall, and you think he's throwing knives at me, right? No, he would mark my height, and he'd put that knife on top of my head, and they just kind of puncture the wall there, and, and put little holes, and then we'd date it, and we'd, we'd just kind of gauge my height as I grew, and for, from the time I was about the seventh grade through high school, you could see those marks, and we would sign the dates to, to see my growth. How many of you guys did that at home, or maybe at grandma's? Did they ever mark your height? Nobody in the entire church. Thank you. So it was really neat, though. It was really fulfilling to look and see, wow, look at how much I've grown when I look back and saw the marks. And that's what God wants to do with your life through the time that you are spending in the wilderness and in the valley and the desert. He wants you to look back and say, wow, Look, God, at what you did. Look at how you caused me to grow. Check this out. Psalm 23, familiar passage to a lot who have been in the church for a while. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast 
for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. You want to know what this scripture was written about? It was written about the flock, and you can compare it or parallel it to the people of Israel, and you can parallel it to your own life. That when the flock was being uh, driven by a shepherd, and he would, he would head through those, those places that were kind of trying. And, 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 and maybe even in some instances, the little lamb uh, would try to escape, would try to, to, try to run away. The, the shepherd had a technique that he would use to cause the lamb to stay right by his side. And, and when you get to the point where it talks about your rod and your staff, they protect and they comfort me. You know, you probably think to yourself, oh, what a sweet picture of, you know, the, the shepherd taking that, that, that staff. And, you know, that hook at the end of the staff, I, I, I should have brought it down. I've got one. But, you know, you, you see that picture of the, the shepherd bringing that sheep back in as he's kind of herding them and rounding them up. Well, that's not exactly all that happened. You see, the word says that Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. That, that's you and that's me. When we were astray, when we weren't living for Christ, we fled away and, and he came after us. And he saved us and he rescued us. But you know what he does. You know what the shepherd does. The shepherd would go after that little lamb that tried to run away. And he would finally capture it. And when he did, the shepherd would take that rod. And he would strike the lamb in his leg or her leg. And he would break the leg. And you think to yourself, how cruel is that? How awful? Why would the shepherd break the lamb's leg? Well, he would then put that leg in a splint, and he would wrap it up. And then he would put the lamb on his shoulders. And every second of every minute of every hour of every single day, that shepherd would carry that lamb on his shoulders everywhere he went. No matter where he was going, that shepherd would carry that lamb. So that lamb was just nestled up right next to the shepherd's neck. I mean, they got close real fast. No matter where he was going, that lamb was sure to go. You guys, that sound familiar to you? That lamb would go everywhere with that shepherd. No matter where he went, he would go with that shepherd. Until the day had finally arrived, weeks and weeks and weeks later, the day finally arrived when the shepherd felt that the leg was now mended and healed and ready for the lamb to walk on it, he would take that brace off and he would let the lamb go. And you want to know what the lamb would do after weeks and weeks and weeks of being on the shepherd's shoulders? You know what that lamb would do? That lamb would walk right next to the shepherd. And everywhere the shepherd would go, that lamb was sure to go. That lamb would walk right next to that shepherd everywhere he went because now they're in love. I mean, now, man, they've got a relationship. They have this bond that's unbreakable. That sheep wanted to be with that shepherd. And that's exactly what God does with us. That's exactly what God did with Israel. That's what God wants to do with you in your life. There's going to be times when you feel like you're going through a tremendous amount of pain. You feel like spiritually your, your leg has been broke out from under you. And you feel like God's done it to you. And maybe he has allowed you to go through a certain time of testing, a certain uh, experience, just the, the most horrible trials you can imagine. Maybe you've been through hell and, and back. And you're asking God why on earth he would allow you to go through such things. Here's the answer. Because he loves you. And because he has a plan and a purpose for him to be glorified through your life. Did you know that God wants to use you? He wants to bring his glory to pass. He wants to show people who he is through your life and through your circumstances and through your trials. God wants to use you in a mighty way because he deserves all the glory and all the power and all the praise. And if you'll let him, he'll do an incredible work in your life. See, God never intended for the Israelites to stay in the wilderness. That was never his plan. And it's not God's plan for us to stay in that season or that place it's up to us whether or not we come out of the wilderness. Point number three and the last point is this. God will allow you to cycle until you get it. And if you never get it, you will die cycling. But that choice is up to us. I love this. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 10, it says this. Do not murmur against God and his dealings with you as some of them did. That some is talking about the children of Israel. 
They were murmuring and complaining all the time. For that is why God sent an angel to destroy them. All of these things happened to them as examples, as object lessons to us, to warn us against doing the same things. They were written down so that we could read about them and learn from them in the last days as the world nears its end. You see, I don't know about you, but as a parent, I tell my kids stories all the time. I try to tell my kids stories of how they can not do what I did, how they can choose to obey and not get in trouble all the time. I tell them how if you don't argue with your brother and sister, then you'll have a better life. We talk about examples. These stories that were written down from the Old Testament were given to us as examples so that we would not end up the same way that the children of Israel did. See, what happens is in our life is once we get into this place, as long as we're on the mountaintop, man, we're excited. We're happy. Everything's, everything's wonderful. But the moment we come down into the wilderness, into the valley, and we don't see water, and we don't see food, and maybe we don't have the money to pay the bills, and maybe the doctor gives us a bad report, maybe your marriage is falling apart, maybe you have a bad relationship going on, whatever it is, maybe it's something small. Maybe you're in school and somebody's bullying you. You're being picked on. Whatever it is, whatever place that you're in, God is, out, is wanting to grow you through that particular place, but it's up to us whether or not we understand, whether we get it. But t we tend to do this. We tend to grumble and we tend to complain. And I can tell you in my own life, growing up as a teenager, the one thing my dad constantly told me that I didn't get until I became an adult is stop griping and complaining. And I would say, I'm not. And he'd say, yes, you are. You are, because when you grumble and complain, what you're saying is God's not big enough to take care of our circumstances. And that's what the Israelite people were doing. And the sad thing is they cycled right there until everybody died off. And it was their children who went in and finally possessed the land of Canaan. So maybe this morning you're saying to yourself, Pastor, I, I know exactly what you're talking about with this place. Maybe you're saying to yourself, I've been there. Or maybe you're saying, I'm there right now. But I want to I wanna tell you this. You're sure to be there eventually. If you don't feel like you've been there yet, you will be there. And that should be, as ironic as it sounds, it should be exciting. Because it means that God is giving you an opportunity to get better and to grow. You know, you've heard us say it before, don't ask God to give you more faith. Ask God to give you an opportunity for your faith to be increased. Because it's really about us, isn't it? God doesn't need any more faith. It's us who need to learn how to have bigger faith. Don't ask for God to give you peace. Ask God for an opportunity for peace to be perfected in you. And, and that's only going to happen through trials and through situations where you feel the most squeezed and the most challenged than you ever have in your life. I had a conversation with a very dear pastor friend of mine the other day. And, you know, real friends can be honest with each other. When one says, how you doing? They can be honest and, they can, and, the, and the other can reply with sincerity and say, I'm having a crummy day, man. And here's what's going on. You know, pray with me. And we were having one of those conversations, and, and, and he was just telling me about how early that morning he got the phone call that, that uh, someone had passed away, and he had to go to the emergency room. Then he had to sit with the family, and, and he had to, and he knew this family very well, and he had to counsel them and, and, and just help console them. And, and it's a very tough thing as a pastor to be there with a family when a loved one has passed. And he was under a tremendous amount of, of, of stress because of everything that was transpiring that day. And, and I jokingly said, I didn't really mean this, but I jokingly said, well, God must figure you can handle it, right? And he said, no. He said, no. No, I don't, I don't believe that one bit. He said, I know that God knows that I can't handle it. And that's exactly why I'm enduring it, because he wants me to rely on and trust in and cling to him and cling to him fully. Because he wants us to be dependent on him and not upon ourselves. He wants us to be placed in those circumstances where the only way to look is up. You might feel like you're flat on your back, but the only way to look up is God and say, Lord, I can't do this. I won't do this. I refuse to do this without you. I need you. I have to have you. That's the position. That's the place he wants you in today. And if you haven't experienced that, you will. And when you do, I want you to be ready to embrace that place. 
in your life and be ready to grow and be ready to change and get ready to get better. Get ready to become more and more like Christ. Get ready to become the person that Jesus needs you to be for his kingdom so that his father can be glorified through you. Be encouraged by this word and, and, and stop blaming God for your circumstances. God has little to do with these circumstances. It's more that he allows you to endure them. You got to remember that you're in a, a, a cursed earth system because of sin. But God uses that to make you better and make you become more like him. So this morning, if you would bow your heads, if you're in this place and you would say, Pastor Brad, I know that I I can't do this wilderness without Jesus. And, and I know that I'm really not saved. I don't have a real and life changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. And I want what I, I see these other people experiencing in this church. I want to be happy. I want to have joy that, that can't be extinguished. I want to have that hope and that peace that surpasses all understanding. If you want that this morning, you have to do like I did. You have to admit that there's things you've said, there's things you've done, there's thoughts you've had that have displeased God. It's called sin. And you have to ask God to forgive you and to cleanse your heart and believe upon the name of His Son, Jesus, who saved you by going to the cross in your place, by experiencing death to replace your spiritual death so that you can have life. And when He was resurrected from the grave, that same power became available to you for you to have not just any kind of ordinary life but an extraordinary life an abundant life not only here on earth but in heaven for all of eternity to experience the awe and the wonder the beauty the love the peace of heaven there's not going to be any more crying there's not going to be any more sorrow no more no more pain Heaven is eternal. It's forever. It's worshiping at the throne of God. It's having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. It's joining a family for all of eternity, the kingdom of God. Join adoption. Join heirs with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. If you want that this morning and you're ready to make that life change, I'm going to count to three, and I want to encourage you to raise your hand, and I want to pray with you right where you are. Are you ready? One, two, three. Amen. And for those of you watching by video, I want to encourage you to do the same thing. I want to pray with you as well. Agree with me in your heart as we go to God. Father, I love you so much, and I know that there's things I've done there's mistakes I've made, and I have displeased you. I ask that you forgive me. I believe with all my heart that Jesus can save me, and he's the only one that can save me. I confess with my mouth that he is Lord, and I commit from this moment forward to live for him according to your word. eyes closed and heads bowed, I just want to commend you for making that decision. Thank you for being honest with yourself and with the Lord this morning. Your life, if you allow God to grab hold of it, will never be the same again. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be the next day. But the time will come when you will arrive to this place the wilderness. You will arrive to the desert. You will arrive to the valley at some point in this journey. And when you do, when I do, we need to be ready to embrace and thank God for the trials that may come, as hard as it may be, knowing that He wants to stretch us and mold us and make us into His image. So let's stop.
and give God our first this morning. God, we just love you. We thank you, Father God, for all that you've given us, God. We love you. We honor you. We thank you for everything you've blessed us with. Let us give you our first, our tenth back to you, God, so you can increase it and grow it. You can do exceedingly more than we could ever do with it. Lord, we give it to you freely, God. We thank you so much for your blessing. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. 918-223-8090. Text give.